page 97. We'll start out this morning by singing a great, great song. It says, Jesus saves. If we join in together, everyone stand and say we're doing so, and here we are. Page 97.
for uh, oppression, oppression, uh, just just substantially on top of you. They stand stand trying to sing this song. It would make a, a world of difference. And uh, you know, I, I think we need to be thinking very carefully about what we're saying and what we're really doing. Uh, tomorrow, your life, my life, will be totally different. Than it is right now. Uh, I was talking to some folks last night. I was talking about how uh, you know, we all remember something about it, uh, six weeks ago.
Turn your Bible this morning to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, looking at verses 1 and 3 to begin with this morning. The title message this morning is, Why Do We Suffer? Why Do We Suffer? Again, looking at Job chapter 42, verses 1 and 3. If you would please stand in honor of God's Word as we read this together this morning as you get turned there. Again, looking at the question this morning, why do we suffer? Job 42, verses 1 through 3. As we read this, this is, so after God has, has asked Job these questions, this is, this is Job's reply. You'll notice that it's italicized in verse 3 because what Job is doing is he's quoting back to God what God said at the beginning of his interrogation of Job. And, and he's affirming and agreeing with what God said there. So in Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 3, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that which I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Let's Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, for your revelation. God, we thank you, God, for, for you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ, for our relationship with you. God, that's what it's all about, God. As we think about your word, the preciousness of your word, it goes back to you, to your character, to your infinite wisdom, to your infinite love, that, God, you have revealed these things to us. And, God, we, um, that's our, our goal here is, is, is revealing these truths, but ultimately, God, revealing yourself, that, God, we can come into a relationship with you. And, Father, I pray that you would help us this morning as we consider this incredibly difficult question of why do we suffer? And God, it's amazing how enlightening your word is that, God, that you can give us um, understanding of this question. Uh, we'll never fully comprehend it, but giving us a, an understanding, giving us direction as we consider this question this morning. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, uh, for being able to read it this morning. We pray your blessing upon it now as it's been read and the other scripture we'll be reading this morning. And that, God, we would be here this morning with a receptive heart, a receptive mind to hear what you have to say this morning. Not what I have to say, but what you have to say and, and through your word and through your revelation. We do thank Thank you, God, again for this time together. We pray and ask all these things now in Christ's name. Amen. So this is an incredibly broad question. I thought about trying to ask it more specifically, but I want it to be incredibly broad. Why do we suffer? And by suffering, I mean everything from an extreme life-altering tragedy or accident to depression to basically just why things didn't work out the way we had hoped. 
failed plans. You have plans in life? You ever had plans that you made that you wanted things to work out a certain way and it just didn't happen? Failed plans, disappointments of life, the frustrations and annoyances of life, and everything in between. And so I'm purposely asking this as a very broad question. Everything from life-altering tra tragedies to the annoyances and frustrations of life. I was helped when we did a series recently um, on suffering on Wednesday night, and it was a video series of Elizabeth El Elliot really doing the, the teaching, and then we discussed it afterwards. And Elizabeth Elliot, if you remember her story or know her story, her husband, Jim Elliott, was murdered on the mission field in Ecuador. When she was very young, they had a very young child. She ended up staying on the mission field for like a, another eight years beyond that, I think, eight or ten years beyond that, ministering to the people who had murdered her husband. She went through this incredible tragedy as a young woman. Her husband murdered there on the mission field. Uh, they'd been married for three years whenever that happened. And then her second husband, years later when she remarried, died of cancer, a very... Um, uh, painful, a very excruci excruciating way to die. She watched her second husband die of cancer. And, and this woman who had gone through, there's many other things in her life, but had gone through these major tragedies. I, I was helping, she pointed out that, that the little things in life, the cares of life, the to-do list for the day, that she also found those things incredibly challenging. And sometimes she actually said this, and I'm, I mean, I'm not saying this on her behalf, but she actually said sometimes she found those things more challenging than some big catastrophic tragedy. The little things, the day-to-day -day struggles of life were sometimes even more challenging than these, these major events in her life, these, these tragedies that she suffered in her life. She would be overwhelmed by the to-do list, overwhelmed by the things that she needed to do. Is it completely different, but, but also challenging in its own right? As I think about that, again, this broad question, um, let's see, last Sunday morning we were over at the church property. If you can remember that far back, it feels like it was a month ago, but we were over at the church property, and just a little example of those annoyances of life. We came back, we were bringing the tables and stuff back, and we had some um, big bags of garbage in the back of the truck, and I pulled the first bag of garbage out. Or I guess somebody else grabbed the first one and threw it away, and I grabbed the second one, and as I was walking over with it, I felt something wet on the side of my leg, and I threw it into the trash can. I looked down, and I had trash water. It hit me down in here somewhere, ran all the way down my leg, was, had filled my shoe up. I was squishing around in trash water, puke water as I would call it, um, I looked back at the, at the truck, and, and we had taken great care to put tablecloths on the table, all that kind of stuff, and there was about a quarter of an inch of trash water that all the tables were sitting in. It was also kind of hot last, uh, last Sunday, if you remember, so we're drenched in sweat, and, and we're pulling these tables out, holding them up, and trying to wipe the bottom of them, and um, that wasn't my preference. That isn't what I really wanted to happen, and there's a part of me and maybe you, you think this is psychotic, maybe you can relate to this, but there was a part of me that wanted to like throw that trash bag, just throw it against the wall of the church and like punch the side of my truck. That's my natural reaction to things like that. I'm, by the looks on your faces, I'm probably the only person in this room who reacts to things like that. But it's those little annoyances on a sweaty, hot day when you look down and you're covered in trash water. Those are things that I struggle with more than a major tragedy, I'll be honest with you. And again, they're very different. They're, it's hard to compare the two, but it's those, those annoyances of life, day-to-day -day things, little things that make you want to, we talk about people snapping. When something like that happens, you snap and you just, you know, it, it isn't that one thing. It's, it's that 1,000th thing. It's the other 999 that led up to that and you lose it. Now, I see people smiling, so maybe you can relate more to that. The thing that causes you to snap. My, I used to drive this black Honda this Honda Accord, and uh, I think Brady's the only one who really remembers this story, but I don't have it anymore. But there was a dent on the top of it, and that happened on a Sunday after church, a very hot, probably July Sunday. I reached into my car to get something out, and as I was, pull as I was pulling my head out, I hit the back of my head on, the on my car door, and without even thinking about it, I slammed my fist down on my car and put a dent in it on a Sunday after church. 
That's, what you, that's a great definition of a lack of self-control. And so for the, rest of, for the next 10 years I drove that car, I saw this dent to remind me of the time I bumped my head. I'm talking about everything. That's not bumping your head or, you know, dealing with trash. That's, those are not major things. But what I'm saying all that to say I'm talking about everything, okay? Suffering, a broad question, and the answers are broad as we think about this. And sometimes they're obvious. Why do we suffer? I, I can give you a very quick one-word answer. Sin. Evil. You ask the question. I, I raised the question. Why do we suffer? Someone could raise their hand in the back and say, yes, evil. That's why we suffer. And that's true. Sin is why we suffer. That does answer the question. Why do we suffer? Because of sin. Rebellion against God. And sometimes suffering is a specific punishment for a specific sin. Sometimes somebody's driving their car, drunk driving. It's dangerous. They go off the road. They hit a tree. They kill themselves. No, no one raises it. Says, no one stands at that funeral and says, why did this happen? They may ask the question, why did, why did, he, why, why did he just call someone to take him home? Why didn't he have a designated driver? Why did, he, why did he get behind the wheel? They may ask that question, but they won't ask the question, why did this happen? They know why it happened. That was, that was sinful. It was destructive. But here's when the question comes in is when that drunk driver is driving down the road, and instead of hitting a tree, he swerves over non-coming traffic. He hits a family driving home. They die, and he walks away. That's the question. Yes, yeah, sin. Sin is why people die. But that's when the question is raised of saying, why did they die? Why did the kids die? They didn't, they didn't, the, the dad wasn't, or the mom wasn't drinking and driving. Why did they die? Why did they, why did they suffer paralysis? And the, the one who caused the accident walked away. That's the kind of questions we're talking about. So sometimes, yes, it is a specific punishment for a specific sin. Consequences of evil. Bad decisions, evil decisions have bad consequences. There are consequences for evil. You reap what you sow. That covers some of the question. But most of the time, it's not that easy. Most of the time, it is not that easy. And that's why we're beginning in Job 42, verses 1 through 3. Do you understand what Job is saying in this passage? This is at the very end of the book of Job, the last chapter. Do you understand what we read this morning? Do you understand what Job is saying? He quotes back to God what God had said in chapter 38, verse 2, that when I have italicized, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? And that, that's the question that, you, that God has to be saying. Job, why are you confusing this issue as if you have knowledge of it? You're, you're, you're hiding counsel without knowledge. You're, you're obscuring this thing as if you knew something when you don't. And, and Job is agreeing with that accusation by God. He's agreeing with that by quoting it back to God. And then he acknowledges this. Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. When that term wonderful doesn't mean good, it doesn't mean pleasant, it means to fill you with wonder. Like, I wonder that. I don't know that. Do you understand what Job is saying? I would summarize it this way. It's complicated. That's really the question in the book of Job is, why do the righteous suffer? You know what the answer is? It's complicated. That's what Job is acknowledging here, and it's, that's true. It's complicated. In fact, it's not only complicated... It's too complicated. Why do we suffer? The answer is it's too complicated. In fact, I would say it's impossibly complicated. God does answer the question. People always say, well, God never answers the question about why do the righteous suffer? Why do people suffer? 
Why do the righteous suffer? God does answer the question. He says this, it's too complicated. Job answers it, and God is, is affirming that it's too complicated. God has just asked Job at the very, just prior to what we read here in chapter 41, he finishes this. God has asked Job, I think it's somewhere around 66 questions. So I saw somewhere someone said it was 77, but somewhere around 66 consecutive questions that God asked Job. And he's doing that. I want you to understand he's asking those questions because some of those questions we have answers to today. Okay, so now we know. These hard questions from God, these are questions that, that put it on a level for Job as he asks these questions to which Job has no answer. I want you to understand that God is doing that in lieu of essentially this. This is what God could have said. He asked him 66 questions. He could have said this, Job, you want to know why this is happening? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the answers. I have listened one trillion reasons why this has happened. Are you ready for reason number one? Reason number two? Reason number three? I have one trillion reasons why you are suffering. Would you like to hear them? And let me ask you the next question. Are you capable of hearing them? See, Job, I would tell you the reasons, but you're going to die of old age before I can even get barely into the list. You're, you are finite. You cannot receive them. It's impossible. You are not capable. I have the answers, but you're not capable of hearing them. Are you capable? No, he's not. As Job acknowledges in verse 3, just those 66 questions revealed the fact, and Job is acknowledging the fact, he cannot answer, he cannot handle the answers. He can't answer those questions, which is revealing just in a very small way. He cannot answer the questions that God is raising, which shows in just a small way that he cannot handle the answers to the question, why are you suffering? The conclusion Job comes to, and it is the correct conclusion, is this. It's too complicated. And so I want to say this morning, I want to start off with in this way this morning. Do not feel bad if you struggle to understand your suffering in life. Do not feel bad if you struggle to understand why things have happened the way that they happened. We will not get this answered today. As, as I'm saying right up front, we ask this question, why do, how do we suffer? It's too complicated. So we will not get an answer today. But we can learn a lot as we reconsider. And this isn't the first time we've considered this question at Marble Hill. We've considered this who knows how many times over in different forms over the last 75 years as a church. We can learn a lot as we reconsider the question. And I want to give you three things to consider this morning on this question of why do we suffer? I'm going to give you three things. With that preface of saying, understand this, the full extent of this is too complicated for us to understand. There are things going on of which we are completely ignorant, that there's no way, not only do we not know them, we're not capable of knowing them. And that's really what the conclusion you find in Job chapter 42. But we can learn a lot from reconsidering the question. And three things I want us to consider this morning. Number one, we'll look in Psalm 130 verse 3. I'm going to jump around a little bit this morning. Psalm 130, verse 3, and in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 through 45. We'll start off reading Psalm 130, verse 3. It says this, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? We come down to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 through 45. It says, Christ speaking, he says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. 
What am I saying here? Why, why am I pointing these scriptures out? What's Christ saying? What is God saying here? I have a friend, Mike Harrison. We do jail ministry together. He's a member up at uh, Madison Avenue Baptist Church. And every time I see him, I'm always kind of caught off guard by this because I don't, I don't see him that often. But every time I see him, I'll, I'll always, you know, you kind of ask that, that, that question. It's not even really a question. It's just a greeting, really. But I'll say, you know, hey, Mike, um, how are you doing? I'll ask him something like that. How are you doing? His answer is always the same, and it always strikes me when he answers. I say, hey, Mike, how are you doing? He says, better than I deserve. And I always stop. Now, that, again, that's just kind of a greeting. It's just kind of a subjective question. But he gives me an objective. He gives me the right answer. That's the right answer to the question. Not, how are you doing, Mike? It's the right answer to the question, how are you doing? If I went down every row and said, how are you doing this morning? You know what the answer is? Better than you deserve. Because if God were to mark iniquity, we've rebelled against God. You shouldn't be here this morning. And I'll promise you, I should not be here this morning. This message is being delivered by a blasphemer. I blaspheme the infinite God. I shouldn't be standing here. I'm standing here this morning doing better than I deserve. And you're sitting there this morning doing better than you deserve. That's a fact. That's the right answer. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. That's the right, that is the right answer. That's correct. That is the correct answer to that question. And it's always the right answer. I feel stupid sometimes. I go into a... I talked to a guy sitting in jail, live sentence. Hey, how's it going? You know what the answer is? I feel stupid. I was at a hospital, somebody laying there with terminal. Hey, how are you, you doing? How's it going? I feel stupid asking that, but you know what? You want to get to a much deeper level? They're doing better than they deserve. That's a fact. It's always the right answer. Give me an example of when it's not the right answer. It's always the right answer. We, are, we swim in a sea of, of grace. We are, all, all of us are here this morning only because of the grace of God. But you know, that's part of our frustration and our disappointment. It comes from the opposite and the wrong mentality. Because what I want to say is, hey, hey Jordan, how you doing? What I really want to say is, not as well as I deserve. Things are not going the way I want them to go. You know, that may manifest itself as, as stress. I've got a lot on my plate. I've got a lot going on. But really what I'm saying, I don't say it with my mouth, but in my heart I'm saying, I'm not doing as well as I deserve. Well, whose fault is that? Implication, it's God's. He should have worked it out for me. These frustrations of the day should not have happened. It should have gone smoothly. Not as well as I deserve. We don't say it. But it's in my heart. It's in my heart to say, terrible, nothing's going my way. I'm not getting what I want, what I deserve. I'm not getting my way. Imagine if you were to say, especially to an adult, say, hey, how's it going? He said, I'm not getting my way. <laughs> Anyone sitting in the room would be like, who's, who's this toddler throwing a temper tantrum? But you see, we don't say, oh, it's, it's going pretty good. I'm doing all right. Ooh, yeah, I'm doing all right. That's real close to saying, I'm, I'm not getting my way. But we're, we would never say that, but that's definitely what's in our heart and what's in our mind. Because here, what it boils down to is this, a lot of my suffering comes from this, I want my way. I want you to do what I want. I want you to do what I want you to do, not what you want to do. Everyone's doing things that I don't want them to do. That's where a lot of the source of my frustration and my impatience comes from. Not as well as I deserve, not getting my way. But you know, it sounds right in our head. But boy, if it came out of our mouth, everyone in the room would take notice and say, what's wrong with this person? But it sounds right up here. We literally live off the grace of God. You are breathing in the grace of God. Your lungs are working by the grace of God. What, what causes all this to, be, to, to exist? The grace of God. Your heart is beating because of the grace of God. We literally live 
off the grace of God. We are sustained by the grace of God. That's exactly what Matthew chapter 5 is describing. Again, I'm a blasphemer. But by the grace and forgiveness and long-suffering of God, I'm still here. How about you? I want us to have the right perspective on this. And if we think about this question of why do we suffer, I'm doing better than I deserve. What do I deserve? I deserve the wrath of God. I'm a sinner. I'm a blasphemer. When I blaspheme the name of God because I was angry because I was throwing a temper tantrum, when I blaspheme the name of God, God should have called me into account that second, brought me before him and said, why did you use my name as a cuss word? But he didn't do that. You know why? Because he's long-suffering, because he's forgiving, because he's gracious, because he's kind. That's why we're here this morning. So the first thing I would say is this. Why do we suffer? Well, we're doing better than we deserve. We have to put that in state. It's complicated, and we are doing better than we deserve. Number two, look at Psalm 119. This is really the passage of Scripture that came to mind as I was thinking about this message this morning. Why do we suffer? For our good and for our growth. Psalm 119, verses 67 through 72. Listen to what this says. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Listen to verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Can you say that? It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. It was good for me that I had been afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. You know what I've come to learn over the course of my life? I've come to learn that I need some stress. I hate stress. I need some stress. I need some pressure on me. Without it, I tend to wonder. I like that song, Come Thou Fount. And that, I think it's maybe the third verse. It says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I'm prone to wonder. I'm prone to get lazy. I'm, I'm prone to become prayerless. Janet's grandfather told me one time, he turned 95 yesterday, and he told me one time, he said, you know, you have problems, they keep you praying. Problems keep you praying. Isn't that sad that you have to have problems to get? I mean, when things are going great, that's when I should be the most grateful and thankful. I should pray the most praising God. But the opposite tends to happen. When things are going well, I tend to stop praying. I get lazy, I, I wonder, I become prayerless. Have you ever heard this saying? Idle hands are the devil's what? Workshop, playground. I've heard it both ways. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Even the world knows that saying. I can say this, based on the scripture we just read, it was good for me that I was afflicted. God has forced me to grow. He has forced me to grow. I fought him, but through affliction, through adversity, God has forced me to grow. Do you know how you get strong? Do you know how you get physically strong? By lifting heavy weights and lifting a lot of weights. That's how you get strong. Afflicting your body 
inflicting pain upon your body, afflicting your body, tearing it down, building it up. That's all working out is. Tearing it down, building it up. Tearing it down, building it up. Do you know how you grow strong spiritually? The exact same way. Carrying heavy weights and carrying a lot of them. That's how you get strong. You know what the other way is? There is no other way. The same is true spiritually. Being torn down and being built up. Being torn down, being built up. Affliction. It was good for me that I have been afflicted spiritually that I might learn thy statutes for our good and for our growth. I'll mention this just, just as an example to help it stick in your head. I mentioned this before, but you think about the greatest presidents in U.S. history, greatest U.S. presidents in history. If you look up a list of who are the, whatever, top ten, top five greatest presidents in the, in the, within the top five, greatest presidents of all time, you're going to find two names in every list I've ever seen. And they share a name. It's Roosevelt. The first one is Teddy Roosevelt. If you know much about his life or his story, Teddy Roosevelt grew up with asthma. Raise your hand if you grew up with asthma in this room. Lots of people. Maybe you still have asthma. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's not. Um, who's ever used like a rescue inhaler before or used an inhaler? What if you didn't have it? Teddy Roosevelt had asthma, but he didn't have an inhaler. He just suffocated as a baby, as a toddler. Can you imagine that feeling if you can't breathe and you could die at any second? Your, 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 your pathways in your lungs are closing up. They're constricting. It's like you're, you're, you're facing suffocation. Every night when you go to sleep, you could die in your sleep or you could die not being able to breathe. He had asthma back at the turn of the century when there were no inhalers. There was nothing to treat it. They would take him to, to warmer climates where his asthma wouldn't be as bad, trying to take him to different geographical locations. But he grew up with asthma. He was weak. He was a sickly little kid. He was afraid of everything. He was picked on all the time. Later on in life, when he, he, he overcame those things. He basically forced his body to overcome. He started exercising, working out, and he, he just willed himself beyond that to make himself more physically strong. He went through Harvard. He got into politics. At the age of 25, he had married his childhood sweetheart. He married a girl that he had met at Harvard. They'd been married for, for just a few years. He was 25 years old. On Valentine's Day, when he was 25 years old, his mother died at 3 a.m. 11 hours later, his wife died on the same day at 25 years old. His wife had just given birth two days earlier to Alice, who was named after her mother, at 3 a.m., his mother died, who he was very close to. His father had already died. Eleven hours later, his wife died. In his calendar, he had all these different notes and things on his calendar. On his calendar, on, on that day, he put an X. And he wrote, the light has gone out of my life. He loved, you think about it, they're very early on in their marriage. They've just had a child together, and she died. From what I understand, he never mentioned her name again the rest of his life. He lived to be 60 years old. Now his daughter's name was Alice, so he used her name, obviously. He never referenced his first wife again. It was too painful to even talk about her name. He went through that. He goes out west after that. To, to, he's in complete depression, completely destroyed. He goes back, to finishes up some things. He leaves office, goes out west, finds himself, is the best way to describe it, gets rebuilt through the West, through gunfights, through uh, all these different dangerous situations, builds himself back up, comes back, becomes one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history. Now, here's what we're prone to say. I mentioned those tragedies in his life, and there were others, but we're prone to say, in spite of all of that, he became one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history. But I don't think that's the right, I think that's incorrect. And I think here's the minor change, that's not a minor change, it's a major change. Because of all of that, not in spite of it, because of all that, he became one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history. The other name is uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Everybody pretty much knows his story. He was crippled. 
at the age of 39. I mean, he was, he loved playing golf. He was a great dancer. He was a politician. I mean, he had a lot of things going for him. He, he, was, he was right on track to become the next president of the United States. And one day he's out playing with his kids. He's been out swimming in the pond. He races his son back at Campobello Island, races his son back. He gets back home. He's checking his mail. He starts feeling a little bit feverish. He goes, he lays down in bed, wakes up the next morning, paralyzed from the waist down, never walks again. 39 years old. They thought he was going to die. He, he, there were times that his, it, the paralysis spread up into his chest. He couldn't breathe. He was just laying there in despair for, for weeks. Again, this is, you know, this is 70, 80 years ago. There's no medication for this. It's just suffering. His legs would draw up so that he, he could, they could not pull his legs. They finally had to force his legs out, put them in plaster to drive them out because they were atrophying. They were drawing up to, next to his body. Going through all of this, goes through years of this. He, he knows it's the destruction of his political career. No cripple's going to get elected, especially back then with the mentality of American people. He knows that. Goes through all these different things. He ends up rebuilding himself. He starts, like Bill said, just like that. From that day forward, you know what his, know what his goal was after, you know, six weeks after, after that day in his life that changed everything? His goal was to be able, with crutches, to walk to the end of the driveway. He made it one time. He failed hundreds, thousands of times. It was his goal. This virile man, nationally known, it was his goal to make it to the end of the driveway. He fights his way back from that, and I mean, it's an, an unprecedented story. He recovers from that, becomes the President of the United States. We are tempted to say, in spite of the polio, he still became one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history. That's an incorrect statement. I think what we need to say is this, because of the polio, he became one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history. You know, when you face what he faced, and I can't even imagine that, 39 years old, never walks again. The Great Depression doesn't seem quite so overwhelming. If you can come back from that, you can take a nation to the Great Depression. You can take on Nazi Germany. You can take on Pearl Harbor when you've gone through that, but only if you've gone through that, because you have gone through that. I throw those out as two very imperfect examples, but examples nonetheless that God sometimes sends affliction into our life for our good and our growth, and it will not happen otherwise. I've experienced that in my own life. I will not grow without adversity, without some weights. I cannot grow. He does it for our good and for our growth. That's part of why we suffer. Number three goes along well this pretty well. You know, we think of suffering is to punish evil. That, that person suffers. You know, this person must have been a sinner above all sinners for them to suffer like that, that God is punishing their evil. And we think in those terms, and that, that is a way of thinking of it. Consequences for your evil... Reaping what you sowed, but how about this? How about not punishing evil, but preventing it? To prevent it. Again, two and three kind of going together for our good and for our growth and to prevent evil. It always stood out to me from the first time, probably the first time I heard the story, when David destroyed his life, a man after God's own heart. Things were going so incredibly well. And around the age of 50, he destroyed his life. It really stood out to me where that happened and the circumstances of when that happened. At the time when the kings go to battle, he was in the palace. He had had all these, it got easy. It got easy. Now the Philistines that were on the run, they were defeated. Joab's going to go do mop-up duty with the Philistines. We are now this dominant kingdom. I'm, I'm a reigning king. I'm universally loved. That's when he was most susceptible. That's when he let his guard down and he completely destroyed his life and becomes an adulterer and becomes a murderer. What if he had had a heart attack the day before? What if he had been under extreme attack from the, from the Philistines or the Egyptians or the Assyrians? Would it not have been better for him if he had? He was better off being chased as a fugitive by Saul than sitting in the palace with his guard down. 
Sometimes it's not to punish evil, sometimes it's to prevent it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. This is Paul writing. He says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, and now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. You know what that means? That means to strike me, to punch me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul was told explicitly by Christ that he suffered these things. It was revealed to him that he suffered this thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was, but he suffered. He suffered so much, and Paul was a tough guy. He went to the Lord three different times asking God, please take this away, please take this away, please take this away. But he suffered for this reason, to prevent pride, to prevent sin, to prevent pride. Pride is serious. Pride could have destroyed Paul. We could look at Paul completely differently today than we do if pride had gotten in. God graciously loved Paul too much. God sent suffering in Paul's life to prevent pride. Think about that. I'm going to say this again this morning as we get ready to close. It's complicated. It's too complicated to understand fully. I want to look at one final passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 4. I've got the, the slides are off here. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. And then that second one should be John chapter 21, verse 19 through 22. And the reason I want to close with this this morning, I, I, I put this as the conclusion of the matter. Why do we suffer? Thinking about doing far better than we deserve for our good and for our growth to prevent evil. These are just a few of the, of the things we could talk about this morning. But as a conclusion of the matter, I want you to see these bookends in the life of, of a man named Peter. Listen to how Jesus begins his relationship with Peter and listen to the end of their earthly relationship but right before Christ descends. After he has been crucified and resurrected, he ascends. Listen to what this says. Matthew 4, verse 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's the beginning of Peter following Christ. They left their nets, they follow him. John chapter 21, verse 19, sitting by the Sea of Galilee, Approximately three years later, Peter has denied Christ there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was not at the foot of the cross. Christ is now resurrected. He's now sitting down with Peter. They're sitting down having, what's in a lot of ways, a final conversation, as we see recorded in Scripture here. And, and he's telling Peter how he's going to die. And there's so much we could say about this, but he just says, If this fake he's signifying what death he should glorify, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him. So he's told Peter, you're going to be crucified. That's how you're going to die. You're going to be crucified for my sake. But then he says this, follow me. Then Peter turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, following it's John, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is it that betrayest thee? Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? What does he say next? Follow me. Follow thou me. At the beginning he says to Peter, Follow me. At the end he says to Peter, Follow me. Follow thou me. As we close this morning, I ask you to stand if you would. I ask our singers to come. I'll say this again, this question of why do we suffer, it is too complicated to fully understand, but we can learn a lot through suffering. What do we do? 
What is the conclusion? Do we despair? Do we give up and say, well, there is no answer? Don't even, write, don't even waste your time asking the question. We can't know the answer. It's beyond us. God has a trillion reasons for why these things happen. We'll never know probably any of them, if a few, if any. Do we despair? Do we give up? Absolutely not. You know, I think Job, we began with Job because Job is a great example. But I want you to understand there is an infinitely better example than Job. Job is a good example, but there is an infinitely better one. And it's Jesus Christ. And here's what I want to say this morning. It's too complicated for us. It is not too complicated for him. He understands it perfectly. Suffering is not too complicated for him. He came through this life unscathed. He came through this evil, perverse, suffering world unscathed. Now you may say unscathed. He got crucified. He has scars as we speak in, in his wrist and in his hands and in his side. Unscathed. Unscathed. He never sinned. He was tempted just like you or even beyond what you've been tempted, what I've been tempted. He was tempted just like us in every way, yet without sin. He never sinned. He came through this life unscathed. And with that, that thought in mind, this imagery comes to my mind. When Christ says, follow me, you better follow him. You better follow him as closely as you can because we're walking through this life. This life is like a minefield. You, look, you think about a minefield, you know what it looks like? It looks just like any other field. That's the whole point. That's why, that's why they're so effective. You don't see it. You're walking through an open field, a clearing. It's all clear. But under the surface, you're walking through and all of a sudden you hear a click. You've seen this in movies. Maybe, you, maybe other people here have experienced this. You walk through a minefield, you hear a click. You know what that means? You're dead. Because when you pick your foot up, when you move your foot, you just stepped on an explosive. It's under the surface. You can't see it. There's so many ways to blow yourself up in this life. And not only that, you're, you're, you're not just walking. You're running through a minefield. There are bullets being fired across your face, across your head, that, that, in front of you, behind you. You're in a crossfire. That's what this life is like. This life, it, it just eats people alive, and I see it every single day. We are in a war zone. We are running under heavy fire across a minefield. And Jesus Christ says this, follow me and do exactly what I say and you will get to the other side. Do not do anything your way. This is a game of inches. You put your foot there, not there. You put your foot here, not here. It's a game of inches and millimeters. Christ ran through it unscathed, and now he's come back and said, through his spirit, listen to everything I tell you. You're going to think you know a better way. You don't. Do exactly. When I say stop, you stop. Bullet, a millimeter over the top of your nose goes past. When I say go, you go, because there's a bullet right here that you're going you're gonna to evade if you move exactly the way I tell you to. That's what he means when he says follow me. Don't do it your way. Follow me exactly. When I say, don't even look on a woman with lust in your heart, I mean, don't even look on a woman with lust in your heart. When I say, don't hate your brother, I mean, don't hate your brother. When I say, love your enemies, I mean, love your enemies. Do exactly what I say. That's what Christ says. That's the conclusion. And this suffering suffering-filled, evil-infested life. The conclusion of the matter is this. Follow him. Don't follow Job. Don't follow Peter. Don't follow Jordan. Follow him. And he will guide us to the other side. He will guide us within a nanometer of where we need to be. He will perfectly guide us through suffering, through trials, through tragedies, through frustrations, through failed plans, through disappointments of life. He will guide us perfectly if we will follow him. As we close this morning, if you need to come and pray.